Hi everyone, this is Kevin Wagner, the Keto Advocate. In January of 2016, I had the privilege to sit down and chat with Dr. David Ludwig at the first annual conference on nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapeutics held in Tampa, Florida. Let's see what Dr. Ludwig had to say. Sure, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and a researcher. I see patients and also look at the nutritional causes of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, in particular independent of calorie content. I'm interested in looking at how food, as a consequence of the nutrient combinations and physiological effects, alter our hormones, metabolism, and even the expression of genes in a way that could either increase or decrease risk for the greatest um, chronic diseases in America today, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. How can that be? I mean, overeating doesn't make you fat. We know that, well, at least in the short term, you can force feed a volunteer for a research study many hundreds of excess calories and they'll gain weight. But what happens? Their body fights back. First, they lose all interest in food, hunger vanishes. Then their metabolism speeds up in an effort to, the body's effort to get rid of those excess calories. And once the study ends, well, first of all, the volunteers are delighted to get off the force feeding protocol, and their weight typically comes right back down to where it started. So we can push weight in one direction or the other, above with overeating or below with calorie restriction, but that doesn't change our basic biology. And we set up a battle between mind and metabolism that we seem doomed to, to fail. Uh, instead, there are, uh, I think, much more powerful ways to alter body weight uh, for most of us, uh, bringing it down from an unhealthy high value that's based upon the hormonal and metabolic effects of food. Well, our studies don't specifically look at ketogenic diets, per se, but uh, we are looking at um, a very close cousin, very low-carbohydrate diets, so they're typically not in the ketogenic range. Uh, in a study we published in JAMA 2012, we compared the effects of isocaloric diets that were either low, moderate, or very high in fat, and saw changes in energy expenditure um, despite the same calories going in and the same body weight, raising the prospect that from a biological perspective, all calories aren't alike. We're following up on that study in a uh, large feeding study being done with 150 people, uh, and we expect the results of that to be in uh, later 2017. And we hope that that study will give us longer-term data about how diet can alter metabolism uh, again, beyond just calories in, calories out. Well, it's a good question because uh, the term low carbohydrate could mean anything less than prevailing levels of carbohydrate intake, which are 50 to 60 percent of calories in the U.S. right now. So you know, perhaps a Mediterranean diet at 40 percent could be considered reduced carbohydrate. Um, in our studies, we uh, look at uh, significantly lower carbohydrate than that, uh, down around 20%. Now, 20% carbohydrate is not ketogenic. It's enough carbohydrate, especially with the protein that you consume, to uh, not drive ketosis. Uh, but that is a very substantial reduction and will have major effects on insulin levels and potentially other aspects of physiology as we're studying. Now, there's also an interesting question as to whether going beyond very low carbohydrate, such as 20, 15, 20 percent, to ultra low, below 10 percent, and creating the envi internal environment for ketogenesis, whether that has an additional biological benefits, uh, either in a linear fashion or qualitatively different. Perhaps the state of ketosis through the effects of beta hydroxybutyrate or uh, other related changes 
you know, shift metabolism or uh, alter gene expression um, in ways that can be used um, medically and perhaps uh, if we could figure out ways to make this kind of diet easier to follow, also in public health besides just the medical approach. But these are really exciting areas of investigation right now and we're going to need much more research to find out whether it's just enough to, you know, you get most of the benefit just by eliminating processed carbohydrates, A. B, you need to take total carbohydrates really low, like 20%, or C, you need to take carbohydrates ultra low into the ketogenic range. So stay tuned. Right. With um, reductions in total carbohydrate or the glycemic index of carbohydrate, which is how fast carbohydrate digests, or both, insulin levels decrease. So the amount of insulin produced by the beta cells in the pancreas uh, are substantially less when a diet has less processed carbohydrate. And eliminating all carbohydrate um, has an even more powerful effect. Um, that insulin alters the ac activities of enzymes and the expression of genes in tissues throughout the body. So that's going to have a profound effect on metabolism. What substrates are being burned for fuel? Um, it may also alter chronic inflammation um, and a range of other clinical outcomes. So this is a very uh, interesting and exciting area of investigation to think about food based not just on calories in, calories out, but based on hormonal modulation of the body. Uh, but again, we don't know if everybody's going to benefit, and there may be people for whom um, severe reductions in carbohydrate have adverse effects. Um, in, in addition to insulin, many hormones of the body change with alterations in carbohydrate amount. In fact, in our JAMA 2012 study, we found that um, cortisol actually increased compared to the other higher carbohydrate diets. Uh, with carbohydrate restriction. And we're not exactly sure why that is yet, although that's been reported uh, elsewhere. Uh, there may be some hormonal stress in shifting all of one's nutrients through fatty acid uh, pathways. We don't know yet, don't know if that's a transient phenomenon or longstanding. If it's longstanding, it could raise some concerns, at least for some people. Um, cortisol, has in elevated amounts adverse effects on the brain and on lean body mass. You know, we know the people with Cushing's disease or people who get too much prednisone for an inflammatory condition will lose their lean body mass. Now, empirically, we're not seeing that uh, among people following very low carbohydrate diets. They don't look clinically Cushingoid at all. But this was a finding in our uh, 2012 study that uh, warrants follow up. All right. Well, um, there are many different low carbohydrate diets, of course. Um, and a basic principle in human biology, uh, usually not all the time, is that going 50% of the way produces 90% of the benefits. So it may be that just getting America off of the highly processed carbohydrates that flooded our diet during the low-fat craze of the 70s, 80s, and 90s may by itself stem the epidemic of obesity and diabetes. Um, that said, there, are, uh, there may be people who have more extreme physiology, either just because that's how they're genetically uh, programmed, or they've had a lifetime of negative influences and have developed a lot of adverse metabolic problems, like type 2 diabetes, the ultimate metabolic meltdown. People for whom much more uh, intensive carbohydrate restriction or a ketogenic diet will really be necessary for optimal outcomes. Um, Tim Noakes, a uh, famous uh, South African uh, exercise physiologist, developed type 2 diabetes on the higher carbohydrate diet that he had been recommending. And he's uh, famous now for 
his pursuit of a ketogenic diet and um, evidence that he's functionally reversed the disease. Uh, I believe he's no longer on medications and uh, you know, has a essentially normal hemoglobin A1C. Now that's a result that we would typically only see with bariatric surgery once diabetes is developed, suggesting that we can accomplish with diet perhaps everything we can accomplish with surgery. So um, who wouldn't want to bypass the bypass?